Absolutely, it's a red line. Uh, most people I talked to held to the belief for some time that it was a, a fuel cylinder explosion or some kind of gas tank explosion because they simply couldn't believe that any movement would find any reason to attack the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, obviously, ISIS, uh, which is most likely the group responsible, uh, has, has gone far beyond the pale, but even this was surprising to people. Uh, I think they've crossed uh, something of a Rubicon here because a lot of their attacks have been geared at inculcating fear. Uh, they're a small group, they're a weak group, so they engage in outrageous acts of violence to try to basically magnify themselves and seem like they're stronger than they actually are. But to attack a site that is revered exactly, as you said, by every kind of Muslim in the world, Sunni, Shia, Ibadi, Ahmadi, Ismaili, whatever, uh, to, to go that far in Ramadan, mm. uh, I think has galvanized a lot of people in the Muslim world to realize uh, how great a threat this is to our own communities and our own religion. Yeah, and, and Ramadan, of course, traditionally, you know, as Becky was saying, it's a time of peace. I think back in back centuries ago, wars would stop for Ramadan. ISIS is doing uh, exactly the opposite. I mean, when you look Istanbul to Dhaka, uh, Baghdad to Medina, ISIS doesn't do anything without thinking about it. What they're saying here, it, it's it's a message, isn't it? It's it's saying you mess with us, you will pay. Uh, at, at your holiest of, of places. Do you, do you see it that way? I do see it that way. I think that they're losing territory. They're being pushed back and pushed out, and so they're, they're retaliating. They want to say that you can't hit us, you can't hurt us without being hurt yourselves. Uh, that said, uh, it's pretty clear that this movement uh, is really the kind of movement that can only be crushed. Uh, the Muslim world from Dhaka to Bangladesh, Istanbul to Saudi Arabia, uh, doesn't have a lot in common, but we do face a common challenge in extremism. And we need a response that's just as global, not just to meet the threat, but to defeat the threat. And uh, if there is any silver lining in this attack, it's my hope uh, that seeing one of our most sacred sites under attack will get people to realize they need to put their differences aside for a little while uh, and focus on eliminating this organization. And, and, and to, that, to that very point, ISIS often likes to portray their battle as, as one of uh, Islam versus uh, the, the morally bankrupt West. But what this shows and what other attacks have shown in, in recent weeks is this is just as much Islam versus Islam or one brand of Islam versus uh, the real Islam. So what then does the Muslim world do about it? Because there's been a lot of criticism, they're not doing enough. Absolutely, they're not doing enough. And I would encourage people to understand that ISIS obviously is a problem, but it's not the cause of the problem. The problem is a lot of failed institutions, a lot of inefficient and corrupt governments that have basically uh, crushed any space for dissent, for disagreement, for pluralism, and driven people either into sheer apathy or into brutal extremism. And so there's something of a feedback loop here that you have governments that are ex ex you know, exceptionally exclusionary and, and hostile to freedom of, of worship, freedom of speech, and they basically create a space for, for extremists to thrive. Now, the reason that ISIS can't be eliminated yet is because there's nothing to take their place. Mm. Uh, even if, for example, the movement is defeated, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is killed, what takes its place? So until and unless the Muslim world gets its act together and develops a kind of social organization that is actually resilient and capable of bringing people in, uh, this is just a problem that's going to keep happening. Well, it's the old so argument. we really need some long-term thinking. It's the old argument. You can't defeat an ideology uh, militarily. You have to replace it with another ideology that's just as acceptable. I, I, won I wonder if you have thoughts about uh, you know, Saudi Arabia being targeted in this way. I mean, it, 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 we can't forget that until recently it was Saudi Arabia that was exporting Salafist uh, uh, ideology, radical ideology, paying for mosques in various countries from Pakistan uh, to, to the Balkans and, and spreading messages of hate. That the, the same type of ideology that, that ISIS espouses. Uh, do you think that in, in some ways uh, Saudi Arabia has got to change its game? I, I would go even farther. I mean, they export radical Wahhabism, and, and I would say it's the government of Saudi Arabia. It's not, by and large, the people of Saudi Arabia. It's the government and, and certain individuals within the society who are exporting this. Uh, but they really brought this upon themselves. You know, when the Arab Spring happened, uh, you had liberal revolutionaries, you had secular revolutionaries, you had Islamists, Islamists, not jihadists, people who believe in, in democratic change in the democratic process, coming out peacefully uh, to try to transform their societies. And Saudi Arabia and other monarchies uh, and, and dictatorships in the region had the chance to embrace this change, to welcome it and to work with people towards creating more resilient societies. Uh, instead, Saudi Arabia doubled down uh, and backed an even more terrible dictatorship in Egypt than the one that was uh, originally overthrown. And, and now they're seeing the fruits of that. Uh, you can't keep crushing people and stepping on them and expect that they won't turn to violence. So uh, ISIS is a reprehensible movement, but Saudi Arabia cannot turn away uh, from its own role in creating the conditions that have allowed ISIS to thrive.